um, and we're a, a network sponsor of Product Design Scotland, which I'm sure Ali will tell you more about. Um, the National Manufacturing Institute Scotland, um, if you're not aware, we're a, a dedicated industrial research centre out near um, Glasgow Airport, or well, certainly we were. When we get fully back into the, to the office, that's where we'll be located. Um, but we have the aim of working with academia, industry and, and the public sector to, to transform skills um, within the man manufacturing sector um, and increase productivity uh, and, and really champion innovation so that we can attract investment and make Scotland a, a leader in advanced manufacturing. We are operated by the University of Strathclyde. Um, but we're supported um, and work with a whole range of other entities, including Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, um, High Value Manufacturing, Catapult, um, and many others. Uh, it's also supported by universities across Scotland, so it really is a, a countrywide initiative. This series um, that we've put together focuses on the, the PDS product design toolkit, um, which provides applicable best practice guidance on, on key topics within the innovation to commercialisation pathway. Um, and we're supported by a range of speakers that have all contributed to the toolkit um, over, the, over the last few months and who we can't thank enough. Um, but I'll hand over to Ali McKinroy from Product Design Scotland um, to tell you a bit more about the toolkit itself um, and then we can dive into some of the topics that we'll be covering today. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Anna. Uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, now, I, I seem to be driving this kind of blind. I can't really see anything. So I'm assuming that if you can't hear me, anything goes wrong, that somebody will tell me. Otherwise, I'll just keep uh, rambling on. My name's Ali McEnroy. I'm the CEO at uh, Technology Scotland, who are the home of Product Design Scotland. Uh, many thanks uh, to you all for joining us um, this morning. Today, we're going to be exploring, I guess, some of those important topics when negotiating the often dangerous and difficult pathway between innovation and commercialisation. Uh, and specifically, we're going to be talking about the first three topics in our newly launched product design toolkit, those being design process, uh, building a business case and IP management. There'll be more on the toolkit later. But before we go on to that, I just want to do just a bit of brief uh, housekeeping. First of all, this session is being recorded, so please be aware of that. Secondly, you'll notice that we have put you all on mute uh, and your cameras off. Um, having said that, we do want this session to be as interactive as possible. So we do encourage you to use the chat function um, on Teams, both to introduce yourself and make comment, but also to ask questions that you may have of our presenters um, later on um, in the session. So yeah, there we go. So um, this is a kind of brief outline of the uh, agenda today. So we're going to be exploring those three topics I mentioned with um, not only some experts in these areas, but also with those who helped us to pull together um, the toolkit um, itself. Uh, and big thanks to them for helping us to do that. You notice that there is going to be time for Q&A uh, towards the end. We will be pulling it all together as one at the end, but we'd encourage you to submit your questions at any point. Um, throughout the session um, when our speakers are um, presenting. So we'll come on to the important part, which is our speakers later, but just briefly, I wanted to give you a, a quick introduction to uh, Product Design Scotland and I guess to Technology Scotland as well. So Technology Scotland, if you're not familiar with us, we are uh, what's termed the cluster management organisation for Scotland's enabling technology sector. Um, and we have 125 members across our three primary networks, um, one of which is Product Design Scotland, and that's the hat, I guess, that we're wearing today um, for today's session. Product Design Scotland is actually the newest um, of our three networks, and it was set up really in recognition of the importance of product design within the wider technology sector. I mean, we at Technology Scotland, I guess almost by definition, we work with a number of highly innovative companies. Uh, often small companies um, uh, as well. And we know that the difference between success and failure um, of new and emerging technologies and products can hinge on getting the fundamentals right. Uh, and design is a key aspect of that. So really we're about connecting, I guess, the technology developers and innovators with the design capabilities that exist uh, in Scotland. Alongside that, we also um, look at the, some of these other aims that are up on your screen uh, at the moment around promoting the value of design more generally and, and raising the profile of the sector. Uh, but as I say, it's important to increase visibility of those operating within those supply chains and making that connection between technology um, and design. 
Uh, we don't do that on our own. Uh, we do that with a range of partners and sponsors. Uh, and as Hannah mentioned, then Miss our, our network sponsor of Product Design Scotland, um, and have been very supportive of the network since it first started. Uh, and Technology Scotland also benefits from our two corporate sponsors in Scintilla and Enigma People Solutions, and big thanks to them. We also have a number of partners within Product Design Scotland, and that's particularly important in relation to the toolkit itself, because it's these partners who have helped us to pull together this toolkit, starting with our first three topics, but as you'll hear later on, expanding way beyond that. In terms of the Product Design uh, Scotland toolkit, this was an idea that's been in, in the making for quite some time. Um, and it comes from recognition that we know that turning an idea into a commercial product is tough. The evidence base um, suggests that it's extremely tough, actually. Um, and it's an area that we explored first way back with an event back in March 2020, the, pretty much the last physical event I did, I think. Um, and it was an event we did with the KTM um, called Navigating with Design to Manufacture Journey. That then led on to a couple of online series and an excellent guidebook prepared by the KTN. Um, and I thoroughly recommend that you explore that guidebook. We see it very much as being complementary to what we are doing with our own toolkit. In the meantime, ourselves and our partners have been developing this toolkit with the idea to provide, I guess, practical best practice guidance uh, on key topics and to do so in a way that's kind of manageable, a kind of pick and mix. Uh, approach to it to give people sort of digestible short pieces to help them in particular areas uh, and focus on particular um, elements, you know, obviously strongly associated with uh, design, but more broadly in that commercialization um, pathway. And we're really excited actually to launch this toolkit with the first three topics, and we hope that it's going to become, um, you know, a, a genuinely valuable resource uh, to many um, for over the coming months um, and, and years. So as I say, the first three uh, toolkits were launched um, just in the last day um, or, or two days, um, and they are looking at design process, building a business case and IP management. As I say, we'll be exploring those three more uh, in just a couple of minutes time. Um, but they are just the, three, the first three in a series. So these were all launched in August 2021. We have another four which will be launched um, next month in September, looking at managing costs, stakeholder management, risk management, and systems engineering and requirements capture. And then we'll be finishing off the series, or at least the, the first part of this series, uh, in October, when we'll be producing another three toolkits looking at uh, supply chains, change management, and scaling manufacture. So hopefully you'll see there that we're, we're, we're tackling a lot of different topics, hopefully in some kind of sensible order, uh, and hopefully you know areas that people have genuine need for some um, additional information um, and additional support. OK, alongside that toolkit, just briefly before we kick start, just um, alert you to the, the additional sessions in this series, um, which obviously coincide with the, the, the toolkits themselves. So the next session will be on the 23rd of September, uh, at the same time, 10 to half 11, and then the final session on the 21st. Um, of October and of course these sessions will all be complementary to the toolkits themselves which you can find uh, on our website. Any further uh, information you might need then don't uh, be shy in contacting me or looking on the Product Design Scotland or indeed Technology Scotland website. So that now brings us to the, the guts of today's uh, session. Um, we're going to kick off in a second looking at our three um, initial uh, toolkit topic, starting with um, design process. Just before I introduce Will, uh, just a reminder that you can submit questions at any time during the session, and we encourage you to do so. I'll be keeping an eye on those, um, and we'll put as many of those questions as we can towards our panelists at our final Q&A um, um, for the final 20 minutes of today's session. OK, that's just about it for me. So it just leads me to introduce you now to Will Mitchell. He's the owner uh, at 4C Design and also chair of the Product Design Scotland Network. And he's going to kickstart our first toolkit on design process. So, well, over to you. I'll stop sharing and hopefully you'll be able to take over. OK, not working. Not on my screen. 
that's shown up now, Will. That's good it. stuff, yeah. good stuff. Okay, excellent. Right, well, thanks for that introduction. That, that's, uh, yeah, that's great. I think, um, just before I kick off, that um, I would like to say that uh, Product Design Scotland have been fantastic in terms of pulling together um, you know, the creative uh, companies that, that, that do supply design and engineering services. Um, across Scotland, it's it's been a great opportunity to uh, to talk over webinars and stuff and actually collate material like this. So um, yeah, I, my role at Corsi is uh, I, I'm MD. The company is twenty. It's going to be twenty next year. So there's um, a heck of a lot of experience within the walls of Corsi, and my own experience extends another five years to twenty five years of design development and engineering. So to take on board the sort of gargantuan subject of design process is quite intimidating, but uh, I will do my best. And I have completely oversimplified here um, in order to make it a sort of digestible uh, reference point so that we can um, get our heads around it. So basically, this diagram was um, the, the fruits of a search that I did online many years ago. And I, I can't take credit for this. This is uh, Damian Newman who came up with this, and probably as a result of real frustration by the looks of things. But essentially, it is the best description of the design process that I can see that I found. I mean, there's lots of diagrams, lots of flowcharts, lots of Venn diagrams, lots of Excel spreadsheets. But this to me, shows the creative process in all its sort of raw state, which is, it is chaos. It is sort of back and forth and up and down and all over the place with a kind of moment of calm towards the end as we actually decipher what we're doing. And it's a design consultancy's responsibility to kind of untangle this. I mean, that said, you'll notice there is no scale, there's no um, calibration to this, which means that, you know, Quite rightly, if a designer is given the brief and left to their own devices, they'll just do it forever. It's just the most um, uh, involving process. So in order to be able to manage that process properly, we need to give it structure. And I'll introduce that in a sec. I just want to kind of iterate why that structure is important. And um, again, another very simple diagram to kind of make that point. So if we break the design process down into three um, areas, so we call it, say, concept, design, and manufacturing, these are the three kind of uh, iterations of the design process. Then at the concept phase, the early stages, we're really talking to our stakeholders. Those are the people that are involved in the ultimate success of the design. And that is, it's never too early to engage with potential suppliers, potential customers, potential investors. You want to understand the business case. You want to be able to pull all that data together at the early stages. And when you are playing around with those ideas and you are essentially writing the brief for the project, it's very easy to make changes. And this kind of diagram ex expresses that, you know, it's easy to change at the beginning of the process and it doesn't cost very much. It's all relative, of course, but it doesn't cost much because you are talking about decisions, conversations, um, sessions with teams and meetings, maybe some really crude prototyping. But essentially it's the research element and that is when you want to be finding out the big uh, challenges. And so as you go through the process and you start to develop into a kind of design um, phase, things are starting, starting to tighten up. You're starting to get an understanding of what it is you're actually building and who for and for how much and all that kind of stuff. So these decisions start to sort of cement that design. And as you can see very clearly, it becomes more difficult to change and it also becomes much more expensive. And really, when you're in the manufacturing stage, you do not want to be making significant changes because that's really where it uh, becomes extremely painful. 
During the concept and design phases, these are still slightly fluid and you can keep visiting uh, the early uh, data and that's great, but um, really, and, and again, very oversimplistically, where these two lines cross is kind of your freeze point. This is where you want to be thinking about, this is where we need to commit to this design. So in summary, it's at the beginning of the project change is easy and relatively low cost. Making changes later in the project can be difficult and very expensive. Now, really obvious i get that but it's amazing how many people just charge on through a project without actually doing their homework properly so if we are to provide structure to really what is quite an organic process um, then no better way to do that than to use technology readiness levels so the design process is the organic kind of you know, exploring research and development and all that kind of stuff. The TRLs, um, they bring the structure. Now, TRLs are a really interesting um, system. I think they were developed, well, they were developed by NASA um, following on from the Apollo 11 program. And my understanding, and I could be corrected here, was that it was in the, in the development of the space shuttle. So this was a very definite program of getting people up and down from space in a reusable craft. Now, we're not doing that. I think it's probably the only thing we haven't done, to be honest, but this structure still remains very applicable to any project. You could be designing a single piece of plastic for a particular market or a very complex machine. This is the backbone of your, uh, of your process and should be um, providing the structure. So just to run through this, uh, TRL zero is the opportunity. That is doing your research, understanding um, what it is you're trying to do, who's the, who are the market, who are your customers, you know, what kind of money are we talking about here? Um, you know, is there a market for it, for example? So the business case is really, really important. And it kind of builds the foundation for the rest of the project. So you then tip into TRL1 once you're happy with the outcome of TRL0, and then you're into the problem solving. So this is about understanding the core principles and um, you know, looking at the evidence you've gathered. Once we're kind of happy with where we're heading, we're into the concept generation phase, which might be like a group session. It might be, um, you know, we do that at 4C with probably up to about 12 people. Um, we call it an innovation sprint, so it's about getting those people together, it's about thrashing through all the research and about understanding where the opportunities lie and what potential concepts can come out of that. So you want to be able to measure those concepts, you want to get into a concept feasibility stage in TRL3 and that is actually around about proving those concepts. So again, referencing back to the data you gathered at the beginning. So you can understand why that data is so important because it's a measurement and if it's not robust enough, you, you don't get enough of a measurement. So going you know through these trls it's not a one-way street we end up going back again ideally around about one two three to four possibly once you start getting into the later trls we're, we're into that expensive territory we want to try and avoid going back too much but trls are there as stage gates they're also there to not let you go through as well as to let you go through so if you need to go back that's totally acceptable um, and uh, has proved very useful as I say, a lot of people use this. It's not just NASA. This is something that we are seeing a lot more uh, when we are communicating with companies and we find it a very valuable communication tool. Yes, we can take a project up to TRL4. We know exactly what the deliverables are and everybody's in agreement. So that works. So at 4C, we've pulled them all together. We look at the technology readiness levels overlaid onto this lovely diagram of the design process. You know, we've got our simplistic concept design and manufacture, and it's very busy in those boxes. You know, when you're at the early stages, you can see the activity as you start to move through to manufacture, things are getting a bit simpler. And TRL 789, you're just getting it all sorted out. It's getting you know, into the, the manufacturing phase and you're starting to look at supply. So this is kind of um, how we, we 
essentially communicate it. And we have so much confidence in this process because of the amount of time we've been doing it and um, clearly our experience. But on top of that, we've actually done it for ourselves. So this is a product that we have designed. So we took it from the very early stages, TRL Zero. We looked at the market, we looked at the business, we looked at the challenges. And we took it right through to uh, mass production and, um, and in fact, span a, span a business out of 4C uh, on the back of it. Um, this product is called Num Nuts, and this product is a tool for castrating and tail docking lambs. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's not a glamorous market, but it is a market of one player, and that happens to be us. We heard about the challenges in uh, castration and tail docking, uh, usually around the welfare challenges. Um, it's really quite an uncomfortable process, as one can imagine. And um, what the, the technology call was, was really to find a humane way of doing it. And basically, that involved uh, anaesthetic. So this is a necessary process in uh, sheep breeding. It's uh, the, the, in the uh, meat uh, market and also in the wool market. It's something that is done um, on a wide scale. And uh, the development of this product was something that we took uh, really seriously, having been introduced to the challenge. So to kind of give you an idea of how that process is overlaid, these are our stakeholders, these are the farmers, these are the people that are using the product. So we had to engage with them really early. You know, what do you do? How do you do it just now? And how can we make it better? Well, it was always going to be slightly more expensive, but it's worth it for the welfare of the animal. And I have to say, this is the happiest lamb I've ever seen. So I think it works. And this is an early prototype. So we were putting prototypes in the hands of the farmers at an early stage in the process. So here's the process, familiar with it. Overlaid over that process are the various prototypes that we developed as we went through all our TRLs. We looked at various injection mechanisms. We looked at various hand tools. We had a lot of existing knowledge from the market and the existing products on the market, which essentially used a rubber ring to restrict the nervous system around uh, the testicles in the tail. And uh, what we were doing was then administering uh, uh, an anaesthetic. And this anaesthetic is similar to the stuff you use at the dentist. So it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it covers a, an hour long period, which is uh, peak pain. So this is pain relief being introduced to the system. So we had lots of prototyping elements to this. Um, and what we essentially then channeled down to was an injection mechanism and a hand tool. And how did we combine those two based on the feedback we got from the market? That's where our end product came from. So we had, and again, I'm compressing a 10 year program into um, essentially what, about four minutes. So there's a lot of work that has gone into this. There's actually a case study on our website about this if you're interested in the, um, in the, ground, in the background of it. So how do you take a product to market? You have to keep in touch with your stakeholders, get a lot of uh, testing out there. We say out there, we had to do it in Australia. Unfortunately, we didn't get a huge amount of support in the UK for um, the, the, uh, the, pro the program. So we had to go out to Australia who were desperate for a product like this. 80 million sheep, huge market, felt like a conclusive uh, decision anyway. So there you go, that's your product. You've got an element that has an injection mechanism, all novel, all designed by us, a uh, um, uh, drug supply in, in, the, um, in a bottle, which is about 60 doses, combined with a hand tool, which could administer the product. This product takes really no longer than the existing process, which was massively important, but does supply the welfare element. And the final tool is now in full production. As I say, it's been selling for about two years. Um, and we have exceeded all of our um, uh, sales activity, which is great. We had lots of targets for sales. And as I say, this gives us a huge amount of confidence going forward when we are talking to existing clients, because consultancies can and tend to work in small sections of the TRL process. 
So sometimes they don't have the knowledge of what happened in the previous TRLs and sometimes they're not involved in the later stages. But having done the whole thing ourselves, we now understand the pitfalls and the challenges on both sides of that. So having to do it by yourself, having to go through all of that, you know, it's, it's reassuring to know that that's what we've done, especially for the clients, clearly. And, you know, we had to put up a website. We had to get this thing out there. We had to, um, you know, the logistics is a huge challenge in Australia. So um, having a website, having a point of um, contact, being able to buy online became um, uh, uh, the best policy to, you know, to drive thousands of miles to drop off a, a unit was just not an option. So we set up all of that infrastructure behind the product as well. So you can see... It's a long journey, it's hard work, but absolutely worth it when you see the statistics. Over 2 million um, lambs have been dosed. Uh, every single farmer that buys this product has signed up to uh, next year's um, production. So, um, you know, you, you can't go back. Once you've done it and you see the change it makes, you can't go back. So that's trying to understand the process and also how it applies to a project. And I hope that just gives you, I appreciate very, it's like skimming a stone across the top of water. It's as much as we can do in the time, but hopefully gives you a little bit of an understanding of how to do it. One thing I would add just very quickly, um, TRLs, there are no shortcuts. It really has to be through the, um, the, the process. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing now. Cheers. Thanks, Bill. That was that was really really interesting, and uh, I think really useful to to map TRLs across the design process and your own experiences as well. I think we can prone sometimes to throw in, maybe not in the design world, but others prone to throwing TRLs about a little bit willy nilly. And I think it's important to remember that, that you know there is a structure to them. They are there for a reason, and yes, you can go back and forward a little bit, but you know they do provide really important staging um, for these types of, uh, of projects. So no, I thought that was excellent. I mean, Will's right, he's only just been able to touch the surface really, but remember that there is of course a corresponding toolkit that you can now go and read up on as well, which will give you that little bit of extra information. So thank you, Will. Um, a reminder, I've seen people that are using the chat, which is great and some co uh, very good comments up there. Please use that to submit some questions as well for Will or for our other speakers um, coming up. Um, and I can now introduce our second speaker and our second topic, which is around building a business case. Um, and our second speaker is Emily Simmons. She's the Director of Undergraduate Studies and Senior Lecturer at the Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship at the University of Strathclyde. So, Emily, over to you. Hello. Hi, thank you. Thanks, Ali. And Will, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. Really loved it with uh, the TRLs. Very, very important to discuss. Now, let me just share my PowerPoint presentation with everyone. And hopefully, we just move some of my, it's a fun thing about technology, you just got to move some things around. There we go. So hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, excellent. Wonderful. Thanks, Ali. That's really helpful. Uh, so hello, everyone. So I'm Dr. Emily Simmons. I'm director of many things at the uh, University of Strathclyde. But for today, the other hat that I have on is I deliver a lot of consultancy around how to launch a business as well as how to scale a business. Um, and so I've worked with Scale Up Scotland and various institutions around the world to help businesses to, to launch um, very successful, usually technology and product um, sort of service type businesses. So uh, today I wanted to bring a little bit of that knowledge to you. Now with the toolkit that we've provided from the Hunter Center, it's very much about how to build a business plan and what to expect from your um, potential investors. Um, so today I thought what I'd do is instead of talking about the business plan uh, as the toolkit has provided, I'm going to now show you how you might take that business plan and create a business pitch. Um, and it's something to think about and it's something that you can use for um, getting funding, but then also to kind of just sense check for yourself if you're doing this right and 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 if this kind of this product you know you've got this really great idea but as you commercialize it really thinking you know where is the market is this the right kind of timing and 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 is everything going right for this um so how can you be as successful as possible and that's really what i'm going to be talking about today uh so if i just move us along here. So how do you present your plan? First things first, you've always got to make sure you are thinking about your audience. So the likelihood is 
you build this amazing business plan. And as much as I would love to say investors are going to read it, they're probably not. They may read the first executive summary, but it's still just as important. And it's really important to really for you as well. Again, sense checking to make sure you know exactly everything about your business and how you would like to communicate it. So thinking about the people who you're presenting to is really important. Having that logical flow, capturing their attention. And, and those are some of the things that we're going to talk about today is, is how can you do that? Um, so that's really what we're talking about today. Now from this, the key, you need to make sure you keep to your key points. Uh, for myself, I always talk about the rule of three. So most people's um, attention span can't go very long. And usually if you've got three key points to make max, they'll remember them. Anything more than that, you've lost them. So really know your audience, really know how you're going to talk to them and keep it to three main points. And I think that is what's going to be really key to making sure that you get across your ideas in a way that helps you build success, whatever that success might be. Um, so some of the other formulas for this, um, I've got a formula for success as well as failure. So in any situation, especially when you're going to be pitching your idea to investors or any kind of stakeholders, really showing that passion and enthusiasm. And sometimes, yes, it might take you out of your comfort zone. You might be sitting there thinking, hold on, I'm the kind of ideas person. I'd like to be in the background you might have to kind of come out of your comfort zone a little bit and almost be, I always talk about this um, with myself being an American originally, uh, saying, you know, be your own American cheerleader. Maybe not too much, but a little bit. Um, and, and really having that enthusiasm will get other people excited. Same with empathy, making it feel as if whoever it is you're pitching to is the number one person in the world. They might be your fifth choice for funding. Don't ever let them know that. That's just for you to know. Um, and finally, be prepared. So obviously, the more prepared you are, the more you practice, the better everything will be. Now, if you want to fail at a, uh, a business pitch, then by all means, talk 100% about your technology. Talk 100% about your product, because if you do just that, they're going to get bored. They, if you talk about yourself, they're going to get bored. Um, if you're not prepared, they're going to think that you're very disrespectful. So really, it's about, again, understanding your audience. What are they expecting? Um, and, and, and really making sure that you fit that to audience expectations. Um, so being very, very clear, being confident, um, even if you don't 100% know what you're doing, it's that kind of fake it till you make it they'll think that you're confident. They'll think you know exactly what you're talking about. So don't worry about that there. All right, so when you have a pitch, there's different what we call layers of commitment. So here are all some of the pitches that I have practiced for myself um, when trying to launch my own business. But then likewise, if you're not launching your own business, but you want to get a promotion or you're networking for your own uh, work or your job, then you might find that you need to pitch yourself or your role or your company that you work for. Um, and so here's the different types of pitches available to you. Uh, the elevator pitch, quite common. I hope everyone knows what that is, but in a minute, basically imagine you're in a, in a uh, elevator with a CEO or someone who's an investor and you've only got so many floors to convince them to invest in you. So how do you do that? Having that kind of pitch, really important. The next type is the, what I like to call the escalator pitch. So it's a little bit more extended, but you know, think about how slow an escalator moves. Imagine if you stepped on the same escalator and you had just that amount of time to talk to them. Today, what I'm going to show you is a 10 minute pitch. Now, this tends to be the typical pitch you would be able to have to um, investors, especially in that first initial why you should read my business plan. You almost have to convince them to do that. Then after that, you might end up having a much longer conversation, which I like to call the commuter train pitch or also the plane pitch. So imagine you're on an airplane, you're stuck with someone, you know, when that sort of journey from, let's say, um, from uh, Scotland to Amsterdam, let's have that quick conversation. Um, and so those are the kind of different types of pitches. Each one has different skills, different context. But today I'm going to talk about the 10 minute pitch, which is very similar to a 10 minute, what I'd like to call a business plan. Now, 
I've got a couple of things in here. Now, I'm not going to go through all the slides. Um, I actually gave a copy of the slides to Ali and everyone on the team that are in a PDF form. So there's more slides, more extra help and support to complement the uh, toolkit. So please feel free to take this with you um, and, and use this in your practice. Okay, so in a 10 minute business plan, you would mostly have about eight slides max. Um, these are just suggestions and you could have um, fewer slides, you could remove, you can consolidate, it's up to you. But here are just some of the key areas of best practice when it comes to business planning. So first off, really you want to wow your audience. So you want some sort of compelling tagline, a really great visual and the company name. So think about the presentation we just had from Will. How many of you are still remembering the squiggly lines? I thought that was brilliant. So thanks, Will. Uh, you kind of helped me out on that one. So we saw at first the big sort of 4C, but then going on to the actual presentation, you know, what is this design? You know, what are the, the problems? What, how is it a mess? So we're telling this compelling story and why you should be paying attention. And that is what you want. And this is the kind of thing that people will remember. So how do we go from a, 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 what looks like a, gump, a, a sort of a jumbled mess? How do we take that and make that into a final sort of single line product? Um, and, and that is a really compelling story right there. Boom, let's do that in one slide or less. After that, you then notice we're not going to be talking about a particular product, a particular de design. Instead, you go straight for the pain of the target customer. Who is this customer? Who? What is their pain point? Um, why you? Why now? How might you pay? Get paid? Might be interesting to say who pays. Um, but for the most part, what you really want to think about is specifically what are the pain points of your target customer. Now, a lot of the terminology that you're going to see in these PowerPoint slides um, and in our toolkit is based around a framework called disciplined entrepreneurship. Uh, this is a, a really fantastic framework by Professor Bill Ollitz at MIT. Um, I've had the chance to work with Bill for about six years now. He's fantastic. Um, and we do a lot around disciplined entrepreneurship and it's a really fantastic framework. So if you haven't come across it yet, this will really help you in trying to build that business case. OK, so once you've got your target customer and their pain points, then you start talking about your solution. So in here, my top tip usually is remember that people buy benefits, not features. Really, really big sort of differentiation there. So you need to explain what your solution is, um, how much it is and, and why you. So really what makes it unique? I think that's the biggest thing here is what makes you unique and how is it going to fit those pain points of your target customer? So the more you talk about that, the more you're able to describe that in a very clear and systematic way, the, the more that your investors or anyone who you're pitching to will really have an understanding that A, you've done your homework and B, there really truly is a market there. And this could be a fantastic solution. Um, once you've done that, then you move on to your market strategy. Now in the toolkit, we talk quite a lot about different ways of, of looking at the marketplace. But here what you wanna do is you really wanna focus on um, where are the customers coming from? What does that look like? And how can you drive customers to your, your product or service? And, and there's gonna be lots of different things that you can do to try and support investors to understand um, what this could look like. So for example, we talk a lot about um, cost of customer acquisition. So how much does it cost to actually acquire a customer, which a lot of people don't usually think about. Um, and then also, if you are going for investment, what is the return on investment and when might that might when might that happen? So in the marketplace, it's more than just about who the customer is and how you're going to reach them. It's also just trying to understand the full landscape as well. So I think that's what's really key here. Now, doing that succinctly in one slide takes practice and time. Slide five would then be financials. So again, I'm going through the basics of a, of a usual business plan. Um, and in this case, by the time you get to financials, you really wanna make sure you're not overloading people. Keep it simple, make it a graph, 
make it very visual. Now, here's an example from a particular company. Um, so this is a company I worked with a while ago, and what we wanted to show their potential investors was the fact that um, unit sales, how many units could they sell? Um, they had two different models that they were selling and what that could look like per financial quarter. And then finally, what is the cash flow? So what is their revenue versus the cash flow? Um, notice at the very bottom, we have a really nice little strap line, projected sales resulting in 4.8 million at the end of the fourth year. Boom, that is it. Don't feel like you have to have to go through loads of finance. Um, or if, for example, this is not your key area, don't feel as if you have to go through loads and get almost an accounting degree to make this happen. You don't. Um, working with someone who is sort of um, an accounting um, sort of expert would be helpful. That way you just make sure that your projections are not um, overconfident, underconfident. Um, they hit the right scales is usually quite helpful. Um, but again, having a mentor, having Having someone that you can work with in your team is always quite helpful there. Uh, final and coming towards the end of your slide deck, you then want to talk about competitive advantage. What does that competitive landscape look like? Who is out there? There will be direct competitors, so people who do something very similar, uh, if not the exact same as what you do, and that's okay, that's normal. There will be also indirect competitors. So these are going to be the type of competitors who um, offer a comparative product to you or something as an alternative. Now, as an indirect competitor, you've also got to remember in this kind of scenario that just because you exist doesn't mean that people are going to buy your product or service. So even the fact that people don't buy or decide to just live with their problem is also an indirect type of competition as well. So just something to think about as you're trying to think about all the different types of competitive advantage you have against all the competitors who are out there. Now, one of the ways that we talk about in disciplined entrepreneurship is creating a two by two matrices where you basically have on the X and Y axis um, the two kind of main pain points or um, what your target audience is looking for in this type of product and service. And the idea is that hopefully in this X, Y axis, you are the number, you're the best provider of it, because if you're not, then what are you doing? You've got to make sure that's what you're doing is you're trying to hit for that target customer. And hopefully your competitors are not too are far away from you. Um, and, and it's just kind of a really nice way to visualize and show how close your competitors are to you. Um, so something to consider uh, when you are thinking about your competitive landscape. In slide seven, very important. So at some point you must remember to talk about your team. Now, if you are at the moment a team of one, I have to say that is a huge risk for investors. Um, even the original founder of Dropbox, when he went for investment, um, he was an MIT grad. He went straight um, to investors and they said, yes, we will give you millions. This is a great idea, however, um, you are a massive risk because investors do not invest in the product or service because products and services come and go. They invest in the team and they do not want to invest in one single person because if that person, something happens, let's say, heaven forbid, gets hit by a bus, that's it. Their investment is gone. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, but you need that team. You need that infrastructure. So they will hire, they will give you investment based on um, the kind of roles, qualifications, the kind of people that you have around you. Seeing that plethora of team and seeing that team that can actually really work together. And then hopefully that team will go on to produce even more products and services. That is what people invest in. So being able to showcase the team today and maybe the, uh, the team tomorrow will be really, really helpful. Uh, your final slide, most important ever, even in a business plan, the most important is the ask. So you always want to have what we call a call to action. So in this call to action, what is it that you're asking these people for? Sometimes you go and do a pitch because you're looking for investment and funds. Sometimes you're doing it because you're trying to get a mentor or you're trying to get expertise. Um, you know, anything you can think of, tangible, intangible, you need to make sure you have a very explicit ask. Because at this point, you've got an audience who's been listening to this entire presentation for about 10 minutes, and I've almost done it at about 10 minutes. Um, 
and and you need to remind them why they've just listened because it might be a brilliant idea but then they say okay that's a great idea but why me why are you talking to me about this it sounds cool that sounds good what do you want from me so really it's about being able to know what your ask is and and really be able to to understand and communicate that to your stakeholders okay so that was a whistle stop tour of not only how to pitch your business idea but also the kind of whistle stop tour of a business plan so for my final slides for you just a couple of quick top tips have backup slides always good just in case people want to know a little bit more about financials or about any market data that you have anything else always good to have some sort of backup for those frequently asked questions um, and when it comes to actually delivering an effective pitch remember that less is more don't try and cram 60 minutes into a 15 minute talk really try and create a 15 minute talk don't have too many speakers um, make sure if you do have multiple speakers and that's fine if you do make sure you have one person who's the main kind of mc lead um, when you're doing this as well make sure you're always focusing on the audience who is the audience what do they need how can i sort of service that need in this very emotional storytelling style um, think about what you just heard previously again will thank you very much for that it was a really great uh kind of presentation because i can go back and say think about what you just heard that was a fantastic sort of almost business case yes it was kind of surface level but it gave you a really good sense especially through the visuals and the the kind of ideas of what the pain points were how, what the solution was and then finally making that emotional connection of how this was such a, a fantastic way of using trls um, so again, just being prepared, practice as much as you can is really important. So for my final kind of help to support you, please, um, if you want to um, find out more, there's loads in the toolkit. Um, there's loads out there in general, but usually it's about where to look. Uh, so for here, um, my two favorite reference books when it comes to uh, business pitching and planning is this one called Made to Stick, really great tips on how to improve your communication skills. And then finally, um, the disciplined entrepreneurship. So I personally like the workbook, mostly because it allows you to write things down as you go and you can kind of make all your notes in it, um, which is really, really helpful. So hopefully uh, two really good, excellent references in addition to this PowerPoint slide, which you can have access to and also the toolkit. So um, that should be everything hopefully you need in a nutshell uh, to get you going. But if you do and need anything else, please do reach out. Excellent, and I will stop sharing now. And I'm so glad I did it in under 20 minutes. That was gonna be my biggest fear. There's such a big topic area. I wanted to make sure I did it justice, but then also not go too far in. So hopefully that was all right for you. <laughs> You and Will are a chair's dream at the moment. We're absolutely bang on time, so that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, no, a really interesting uh, presentation, and, and I was particularly interested in that sort of balance between some of the practicalities, but also the kind of emotional and personal aspect of both the pitch and the, the business plan um, preparation. And I, and I do wonder if perhaps maybe in the technology sector, that's maybe something that we tend to neglect a little bit and maybe do focus a little bit too much on the technology. So some interesting tips there. And also, I, I mean, very much complementary to the toolkit itself, Itself. And I, I very much encourage people at home to, to go and read that toolkit where there's a lot more detail on how to set up that plan. And it's all done in really nice bulleted fashion. It's very easy um, to, um, um, to, to, to negotiate. So, so please do go along and, uh, and read into that. OK, yep, just a, a reminder to keep those uh, questions and comments uh, coming. And in the meantime, we're going to go to our final speaker of the day, who's uh, Peter McBride. He's the founder at Centella, and he's going to speak to us about IP management. Peter. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. And thanks to Will and uh, Emily for the, uh, the fantastic presentation so far. Lots of useful tips in there. Uh, just give me a second, I'll share my screen. Um, so somebody message or shout if there's a problem with the screen there. Um, so yeah, uh, at the Centella, we're, we're very privileged and proud to continue our uh, support of Technology Scotland and very happy to contribute to the uh, the IP part of this uh, this toolkit. Uh, credit goes to my colleague uh, Gerard Giroux, who was the uh, kind of lead author. Uh, I just get to to be here and take all the glory for it. So uh, 
uh, that's kind of where, where we are. So um, I thought I'd, I'd run through um, basically a few kind of key uh, aspects that sprung to my mind when I was considering uh, intellectual property uh, with respect to uh, product uh, design. Um, so yeah, I'll just uh, jump jump straight into them. This is the kind of topics I'm going to be uh, to be covering off. Um, so first of all, you'll be aware that um, about 78% of statistics are completely made up. Um, so if you excuse the uh, that classic gag, uh, you'll see various stats in the media talking about how much value is tied up in uh, companies' intellectual property. Uh, there's various. This is just the first two hits from a from an online search. People are reporting ninety percent of a company's business is in its in, intangible assets, seventy five percent of deal values. I think Scottish Enterprises website says eighty percent of a company's value is in its intellectual property or its intellectual capital. And um, so you can see that if if IP is such an important part of your company's value, it's something that you need to be very uh, careful how you manage and how you, you administer uh, the IP. Now, what, when we're talking about IP here, we're talking about it in the broadest sense. So it's your, your reputation, your goodwill, your know-how, your skills and knowledge, your social capital, your um, you know, your trust pilot rating, your reviews on TripAdvisor, you know, all these kind of things uh, are, are your intangible assets. Uh, and it's just to distinguish from uh, tangible things like your stock and buildings and vehicles and, and things like this. Um, so in a very wide sense, it's uh, something that has, has real value. So um, if you as a business don't know what IP you have, and you don't have a process for managing it, then I think you're at risk of selling yourself short uh, and not kind of realizing proper value in, into your business. Um, one of the key things I wanted to kind of uh, address with this talk is obviously in thinking about product design, both from the context of um, you know, being a corporation, doing it internally, but then also kind of being a product design company and having clients and entering into more of a collaborative uh, kind of uh, arrangement, which is where we see a lot of tension around the IP side of things. Um, time and time again, I see disputes or disagreements where the parties have not set out their understanding and their arrangements well in advance um, and questions about ownership of intellectual property come up time and time again. Uh, when you're, if you're a product design company, um, when you engage with clients, you obviously have a range of different uh, types of clients and maturity and levels of understanding of the product design process. And it's just really, really important to uh, make sure the scope of an engagement is determined in advance. And you'll obviously focus on things like the defining the project and the timelines and the budgets and everything like this. But actually how you deal with the intellectual property can be uh, can, can be some uh, sticking point very, very often. Um, so it's really important to kind of agree uh, these things in advance, particularly if there's any uh, collaboration uh, in, involved. Um, all businesses are all business collaborations are based on at the end of the day trust between parties. You know, do you trust the confidential information to to hand over? But um, if you don't have the actual legals in place, then you can run into problems uh, if you haven't kind of anticipated uh, the other side's perspective. So that's the first thing is to get your IP uh, ownership. Uh, clear, particularly if you're collaborating and particularly if there's multiple parties involved, being clear about who owns and benefits from IP that's generated as part of the, the project 
is is very very important. Um, the other thing when it comes to IP is uh, to do with the timing. Um, this is particularly important when you come to the registered IP rights, where I'm uh, including uh, patents and registered designs. And um, these these protect new inventions and the appearance of new products. But these both have what we call uh, legally novelty requirements, where uh, protection, valid protection can only be obtained if uh, the, the relevant invention or design hasn't been put into the public domain before the filing date. And um, so that means you need to decide what protection you're putting in place before you put a pro product uh, into the, the, the public domain. Now, particularly when you're in the startup phase or have a lack of funds, this is very difficult because you're in a bit of a catch-22 situation. You want to promote your new product or, or service uh, to, to market it, but you also want to protect it and have that protection in place, but you often don't have the budget for, for that at the time. So actually, it's a pretty delicate balance. In general, um, the, the, a basic principle of the IP registration systems when it comes to patents and registry designs would be that whoever files first wins. Now, there's lots of legal complexities to that I'm not going into, but you know, if, if you imagine a third party or a competitor developing in a similar space, if they file first before you, and by coincidence have done something similar, then you could be in a tricky position. So you want to file as soon as possible. But on the other hand, you want to make sure that your product and your ideas are fully developed uh, in order to, to make a filing that actually reflects the commercial realities uh, and also then to control and delay budgets and, and things like this. So there's a delicate balance to be struck. I thought this was illustrated very well in uh, Will's uh, presentation earlier, where you could see the, the variety of prototypes that were being developed um, at the start of the, the NumNuts development uh, actually illustrate the, the fallacy of maybe filing too early because you could be filing for stuff that then radically, radically changes. So getting that timing right is crucial uh, when you're deciding on an IP uh, registration strategy, uh, particularly for inventions covered by patents or uh, designs covered by, by registered designs. Um, another little thing I wanted to throw out is the question, uh, the availability of uh, IP resources to give inspiration. Um, there's a lot of uh, databases uh, available, uh, including free publicly available databases that you can search and see patents which have been filed by other people. So when you're doing research on uh, solutions in the marketplace, or other kind of um, uh, landscaping or trying to kind of work out how different problems are solved, there's a tremendous amount of information available in the patent uh, databases, and people often overlook this. And um, the, whole, the whole purpose of the patent system um, is to encourage innovation, okay? This is the whole reason why the patents are, uh, the system was, was created, and it, Nowadays, that's often misunderstood because patents are seen as being restrictive or stopping people from doing things, particularly when you have, uh, say, patent trolls or people saying they've invented the hyperlink and wanting to sue everybody. There's a lot of bad examples of, of uh, stuff like that. But in principle, the system's designed to encourage innovation and is doing this by dissemination of ideas. You publish your invention in exchange for a limited short-term monopoly over the, the, the rights that give you the right to prevent others from commercializing that invention. Um, and that, so that's the basic exchange you make. But if you stop paying your renewal fees or you abandon the application, then that information is there and is free to use for other people. So people often overlook this and you can search in the patent databases. And we help some of our clients in the kind of ideation process to actually say, well, actually, let, let's look at some some cool patents for for inspiration 
uh, to see uh, see what you're you're doing or what other people are doing. You can also go dig deeper and get specific competitive intelligence. You can research to see what competitors uh, or leading players in the market are filing, and you can extrapolate some trends and kind of make predictions and see uh, the, the direction of travel for a given technology area. So there's a lot of uh, analysis and research that can be done. One qualification to that is, obviously when you start looking in the patent databases, it's very, very interesting from a publication perspective, uh, but it can also throw up questions of, well, maybe I'm infringing or stepping on the toes of somebody else's patent. So you need to get kind of, you need to work out your strategy with that because you might uncover uh, problems uh, as well as having the benefits of, of the intelligence that you, that you get. So you need to kind of make an informed decision on that. But my view is that the benefits outweigh the risks for, for in a lot of cases. So it's actually really, really like an underused resource and something that's available for, for ideation and uh, discovery of, of, of solutions. And um, so, yeah, um, those are the kind of some of the, the, the kind of topics that I thought were relevant for um, for for IP uh, in in product design. Um, our toolkit will have a lot more information uh, on some specific topics and uh, some practical uh, guidelines. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I'm aware I've gone slightly under time, but I'll happily chat for hours and hours and hours in the Q and A. And um, so yeah, that that's my little uh, presentation. Thank you all very much. That's excellent. Thank you, uh, Peter. And don't worry about being a little bit uh, under. That's much easier to deal with than going over as a chair, as I say. So um, more more than happy with that. It, it, it's really interesting. And, and, and one of the reasons that we, we contained IP management as part of the toolkit is that throughout the, the work we did on the Navigating the Design to Manufacture um, series that we ran with the KTN, I would say across, across the piece, the most common question asked was around IP. Almost every session somebody was asking about it and particularly around uh, timing and things like that. So I'm sure there may well be some questions come in um, from others on the call, but that's why it, um, it, it was included. So again, as with all the toolkits, I encourage you to go along and have a read. I have put a link in the chat um, to, um, to make it a little bit easier for you. OK, so that's the end of our three presentations. So we are now into full Q&A mode. Um, so maybe ask Emily and Will just to, and Hannah indeed, just to make them sit there, they all are, um, coming back to life uh, for us. Um, so we have had some questions coming through and Emily, I know you were particularly keen to um, answer one, but just for those at home who may have missed the question itself, it uh, came from Ross. Thanks, Ross. And he asks, Emily, is the business model canvas still relevant in 2021? Emily. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, and I thought that was a great question. So thank you for that, Ross. Um, uh, yes, but I think um, one of the things that I, my my motto in life and in business is that it's situational and it depends. Um, so that, that seems to be my answer for everything. But uh, yes, the business model canvas, I think, can be useful, especially for people who are very visual and maybe are not used to that kind of way of thinking. It can be really helpful. So um, one of the things that, um, for example, discipline entrepreneurship which I talk a lot about um, is one of the frameworks I personally love uh, mostly because it helps everyone from uh, the engineers and the sort of medical and scientists that I work with all the way through the artists uh, it's really helpful um, but even in, in that framework one of the key things that they've done recently is to um, take the 24 steps that they have and mold that to the business model canvas so I think that you'll see a lot of places around who say, you know, here's one way of, of building uh, your business plan. And oftentimes they will sort of sometimes link it into that business model canvas just because, again, it makes it quite visual. So, so yeah, so I think there is definitely still scope for that. Um, I, there's always room for improvement, but I think for now it's a really great way to kind of um, give you the foundations of what you need. OK, thanks for that. Um, uh, I'm just going to kick off the questions as they have come in. So the next 
question. I'll, I'll come back to a couple of the comments as well. Actually, the next question we have from Amal, thanks, is uh, to you, Peter. Um, and I see you sort of answered that, but maybe just um, if we could do that um, for, for the wider audience. So I'm always asked, is Google patent search a good way to research on ideas? Um, and are there any other patent databases that could be used to do a basic search? So a very practical question there. No, thank you. And uh, the, the, I think somebody had mentioned in the, the comments, there's a resource called ISPASNET, uh, which is run by the European Patent Office, but it's a global uh, patent database, which is in my view, pretty much the best free uh, resource that's uh, that's available and it's pretty uh, intuitive. It's interesting that the patent offices, patents are all driven by public policy. So the patent offices, the UK Intellectual Property Office, the European Patent Office and various others, they are all trying to make patent information accessible to the public and they're constantly improving and innovating on the tools and we've seen great strides in recent years to, to make things uh, uh, available and, and digitally accessible. So uh, th that is a pretty uh, good uh, tool, tool to be used. Um, every patent that's filed, a human looks at it and says, what field of technology is this in? Because uh, we as patent attorneys write in a weird, strange language that nobody can understand. Uh, so we might call one uh, particular widget a different thing depending on you know wh who's drafting it so they classify everything into different buckets of technology areas and you can navigate through these classifications and it's, it's very very fine-grained uh, and you can use a combination of looking through these classifications and, and doing keywords and um, so it's quite a kind of user intuitive uh, interface that uses various you know, Boolean search terms and, and things like this. So, yeah, there's a, there's a great number of resources out there. Google Patents, obviously, is is good. It's a little bit more limited uh, in its coverage, but it is more kind of full text uh, searching and, and indexing. And indeed, Google and the European Patent Office have uh, collaborated to provide some machine translation for for tools. So, even when you have documents in, uh, say, Chinese or Japanese. You'll, you'll find that there's at least an English language abstract uh, together with the classifications. I mean, you can you can navigate those uh, as well. So machine translation has really, really helped, uh, you know, uh, make this information more widely, widely accessible. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter, for adding a bit of detail to that. Yeah, I did notice actually that the uh, question was answered by Ross in the chat and we Thoroughly approve of attendees uh, answering each other's <laughs> questions. That is that is excellent. So thank you, Ross, um, for that. Very much a community here. It's all about answering each other's bits and bobs. So that's absolutely perfect. Um, we've got uh, another question for you now, Will, actually. Um, and uh, so Ross asks, so although the design process is uh, messy, which I think we're all agreed it, it, it certainly is, uh, does 4C follow any design methodology or um, are any design techniques, tools common for all projects? Um, I, I've just noticed that I've clicked something on my camera, which makes me zoom out. So I don't, you can't even see me anymore. I'll try and zoom in a wee bit more. Um, the it's a good question. Um, really good presentations, by the way, because that all just kind of stacks up. If you know what I mean, when you do a presentation, then the follow-on one has got some points that totally cement what you've been saying. So yeah, that, that was um, uh, they, they were great. Uh, the so the design methodology I really struggle with this I always have um, you know Google design methodology and some diagram pops up that's so beautifully convenient that it you know it's like you know walk from A to B to C to D and and you know before you know it you're a millionaire I think the it's not so yeah I I think what we did many many years ago which was uh, very clever and I'll say so myself was. Um, we spoke to people at IDO. I don't know if you've heard of IDO, but IDO are just um, an incredible operation. Um, started probably in the 70s, uh, based on a lot of methodology um, created by Skunk Works, which was uh, through Lockheed Martin. There's a whole host of history on this. Essentially, um, it was the sort of exploratory 
um, interview-based research that dug up all the kind of uh, constraints that you needed for your project going forward. They had some really nice methodologies. They use um, cards and stuff like that. But we spoke to them. Uh, actually, we had an ex-employee from IDO join us for a while, and he brought in a lot of incredible knowledge. But what we have done over the years is kind of develop our own process, which suits the way that we work, because we are trying to uncover as much as we can at the beginning. Um, Ali, you mentioned a, a programme that, or a, a, an event that was the last sort of physical event we were all at in 2020. And um, I think it was Abby Hurd that put up this st statistic that 97% of um, technology or product-based startups fail. And that's catastrophic. I mean, that's absolutely catastrophic. So if that's still happening, there really isn't a methodology that works for everybody. And the actual point of that is that people are still not doing their homework. So we are trying to uncover a process that, that really digs into what you're trying to do. What are you trying to achieve with this? You know, regardless of what that idea, just drop the idea just now. Let's actually look at the reason behind it. Um, and as a result, yes, we've created our own. Um, we do things called innovation sprints, which are uh, a research-based uh, program with a big, heavy brainstorming element in the centre of it with a lot of uh, follow-up work after it. We do innovation reviews where we actually take an idea and we say, let's rip it apart and go back a bit and then go forward. Um, so, yes, the, the, the short answer to that is, um, it's probably too late now, but the, um, is that the, the, there are methodologies out there. I don't take a huge amount of heed of them simply because uh, the experience that we've gained over the years has proved a lot more useful. Um, and as a result, we tend to kind of own that side of it. Okay. Thanks. Well, maybe if I could just ask a kind of follow-up question, because uh, it's, it, it's based exactly as you say on your own experiences. It's really interesting in that kind of design process curve, if you could even call it that, that you showed. Yes. It, in your experience working with your, you know, various uh, clients and partners uh, uh, and others, or what you've seen, where do people typically, mo if there is an answer to this, most often go wrong in that process? Because what I sense may happen is that people try and flatten that line as quickly as they possibly yeah. can, Too soon, yeah. or they should be flattening that line. Yeah. Which I imagine would lead to all sorts of problems. Is so. Is there anywhere where you feel people begin to, or most commonly, make that mistake? Um, this is such a good question because um, it's got so many strands to it in the sense that. So historically, okay, try and do this quickly. But historically, as a consultancy, what tended to happen was companies would come to us and say, "Can you take this?" product forward, i.e. we have a product, we'd like you to design it, you know, to make it look pretty and, and, and get it ready for manufacturing. And so kind of at the very, very early stages of 4C, we would say, yes, no problem. And we get involved with the project and then potentially that might fall over or, or we wouldn't hear what happened to it. And so out of pure curiosity, every time we were getting a brief, we would question the brief and ask, you know, what research have you done? And sometimes we would find it was just a bit of a hunch. It wasn't really anything sort of solid behind it. Um, and as time has gone on, we insist on being um, involved in that very early stage of the design process so that we can find out what, uh, you know, just to back up what's happening. because. There's a responsibility on a designer to make sure that when you are dealing with somebody's product, which could be a proper business, you know, big game changer for a business, that you are actually doing it to the best of your responsibility, the best of your understanding. And if there's too many questions about where did this product come from, it becomes very precarious. Um, so, you know, Peter, you made the point of just of people jumping on a patent way too early you know timing is everything uh, as you saw from our presentation that, that the you know lots and lots of prototypes we could easily have tapped into a technology and said you know that's the one but then found out much later that it wasn't and so we we left it as late as we could um to cover the ip so it's it's a common problem that people jump on an idea too quickly. It's a common problem that they just don't do the research to find out where the benefits are, especially in the business. You know, it's a remarkable amount of companies that will think of an idea and try and pursue that without any idea of how they're going to actually manage the manufacture and distribution of this thing because they don't have the infrastructure within their own business. And somebody should have flagged that up. 
So, um, yeah, there's, there's hundreds of reasons um, and really the best way to actually get under the skin of uh, a, a project is just to go back, and uh, which is really hard for a lot of people, um, even just, just to see whether, what the homework looks like. And Emily, I'm guessing that's something that you see quite regularly um, uh, um, uh, as well. Is anyone like to comment on, on, on that in, in relation to what Welsh just said? No, absolutely. I just to completely agree. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's one of those where it's very much a cyclical process. And but you can sometimes get stuck in a model in a process, and and you know being able to be very aware of of why are you doing what you're doing. And oftentimes when I work with um, engineers and designers, uh, particularly with like technology, then it tends to be. Um, they're so focused on the technology itself, you're almost forgetting the wider picture. So yeah. again, that's where IDEO comes in. And I, I love them. They're brilliant. And I do a lot yeah. of stuff around that as well, because it's about being human centered. And what are the pain points? What are, why are we doing this? Why is this technology important? And, and not just to us. So one of the things that I'm very keen to teach people is to you know see the business through the eyes of the customer not through the eyes of the business so not from you you know you might have come up with this amazing idea yes that's great but how does the customer see it? How is that kind of potential um, beneficiary seeing it? You know, whether it's a commercial product or it's for social purposes, you know, you got to make sure it's always the human is at the heart of everything that you do. Um, so the more that you do that, that you, you'll you find that success is a lot easier to come by. Thanks, Emma. It seems to be a lot of love for IDEO in the chat. Yes, well. yeah. <laughs> Not surprised. Really. Um, I, I wonder if I could just sort of briefly follow up with you, Emily, because we, we at Technology Scotland, as the name suggests, we focus predominantly on technology and engineering. Um, and I always wonder when um, you know when you talk about relating to your investor or relating to whoever you're pitching to, in your experience, is there a difference when you're dealing with technology and engineering products and services and, and solutions as opposed to other areas? Because the it seems to be the feeling that, that we get, uh, and from my own experience in the past, actually, that um, it, it is a slightly different approach. Is that fair, do you think, or should people be sticking predominantly to sort of the general rules apply? I think it is fair. Um, I, I still think the general rules do apply, but I think you're right. It is very different, and especially when you are coming in to, to even if you're going to talk to an investor for example and you've got this technology they usually see it up front they kind of know they kind of it will expect but I think sometimes there's also some dangers and stereotypes uh, they will expect the the engineer and the designer or you know in in the terrible stereotypes we'll think of that we can sometimes think of people like my my partner for example he's um, he he was a, a trained physicist who now is computers uh, sort of computer design engineer and it's really fascinating because when people think of him or think of that kind of side of things, they don't realize that he's actually really good at talking to people, really good at making things clear. He doesn't sit in a T-shirt in a darkened room and, you know, uh, listen to heavy metal or something. You know, these really terrible stereotypes we sometimes have of like computer people and, and this, certain things. But and I hate to say it, but people will start to have these stereotypes. So you've got to try and and get past that, um, I think, is one of the key things. And sometimes when you go into a room, people will already think, OK, you've got this technology you're trying to pitch to me. Right. They're an engineer. OK, so they're going to pitch to me like an engineer mm -hmm. and it's going to be a technology or I'm a des they're a designer. So I'm going to expect lots of these kind of pretty pictures, but no substance. So we've got to get them past that because that's not what you are. That's not who you are. But that is sometimes what people might think um, and that I think would probably be some of the insight that I've seen um, speaking to some investors who even I've had to teach them how to stop with the stereotyping um, when people come in to, to pitch a particular uh, technology but yes it, it can be different I think you do need to make sure that you've got your statistics your your everything to showcase why this is really needed but again that human side remembering your audience who you're pitching to why you're there what the purpose and the the value added is i yeah. think are the things that are really important no matter what it is you're pitching thanks both for that and um, we've, we've got another question uh, come in which is aimed at will although uh, peter i might come to you um, yeah. on part of this as well but it's from Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, oh, hang on. Somebody else has just come in and it's pushed it up my page. Hang on a second. <laughs> um, 
There we go. Okay, so, uh, uh, well, how much does freedom to operate feature in Forsey's usual process? Um, so, basically, when we engage with a, with a client, we will... There's a kind of rule of thumb which is about understanding how much you're willing to invest based on your perceived return on investment. So, if, for instance, it's a £2 million opportunity, you'd expect somebody to put in around about 200000 to be able to, um, you know, ideally, I mean, that that's a nice round number. Um, but sort of 10 to 20 percent maybe um, would be an investment uh, on an opportunity. A lot of people probably, they might be in a slightly more constrained position and not have access to that kind of uh, funding. But uh, the way we would engage with the customers to give them options. So, you know, we've got like 4C Unleashed. How would, how would we do it, i.e. numnuts? How do we do it with numnuts? We spent a couple of million quid actually um, getting this through, spent 10 years developing it. So, you know, it was a very, very heavy project. Um, so that might be how, you know, 4C Unleashed. And then we've got the scale, which is the sort of middle ground, which is, you know, that this is the budget that would cover this, this, and this, take you to TRL4, and then maybe at that point you'd be able to release more funding. And then there's maybe just a very basic, you know, um, you know, to pick up on your point, Emily, it's like, what, what if we were just to get that technology to a point where you could actually present it and start to gather momentum that way, so almost translate from the pure technical into something that was uh, much more... Um, digestible and that's kind of so we, we give people options and um, the freedom to operate is basically how much money have you got because we can do whatever you want to do um, but, but I would argue that that has to be utterly proportional I mean it has to be proportional to the return otherwise it becomes very expensive for no real gain um, so that we, we'd love working with big companies because big companies have got um, you know kind of a lot of this already embedded. They know how much they can they can spend. So it's really just about negotiating around that budget. So Peter, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, no, absolutely. So obviously, from a freedom to operate perspective, you look at your housekeeping in terms of your licenses and everything that you've bought and collaborated with to make sure there's nothing there. But obviously, the catch with patents is that. A third party could own a patent and you launching a product could be within the scope of somebody's patent and it doesn't matter if you've never known about it or not copied anything you're still infringing because it's legally overlapping so this freedom to operate with for with patents is very very simple but also impossible at the same time because what all you have to do is look at the product you're selling and look at what's written in a patent and just read the, the what we call the claims, the legal scope of the patent. So you just read it and say, do you overlap? And then if you do, then it's an, you know, a potential obstacle. Um, the reason it's impossible is there's just so many of these things. <laughs> there's millions and millions and millions of patents which are you know, in force in any given, given territory. So it means that if, if you come to me we're, we're asked for freedom to operate so many times and nobody ever, like for, from startups or people who have not done it before, they never really need it. Um, so if you said to me, look, here's a product, I want to have a, a reassurance, I'll never infringe anything, then you know, that costs so much money to actually dig into. So we kind of need to tease out what's actually uh, involved here. Everything involves risk. So when you're, when you're, when you're kind of putting a product out there, looking at the IP questions, it's about minimizing the risks and doing that in a way that's kind of proportionate, as Will was saying, to the to the investment, to the, yeah. the, the market opportunity and things like this. So there's absolutely no point in kind of spending you know, six figure sums on legal opinions uh, if, 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 if it's not really you know worth it kind of thing. So it, it is a bit of a tricky one. We, yeah. we tend to look at it on a commercial basis. So we kind of do, you know, a kind of commercial freedom to operate exercise where we look at how subjectively crowded a field would be. Uh, is there a kind of gap 
in in the coverage in this area or, or is it a new area an established area um, maybe look at some of the competitors that you have or the people you're concerned about um, and say well what are they doing are the risks there uh, because you know you you might be launching a a, a product and you know maybe I know Facebook has got a bunch of patents that might you know, be relevant, but are they actually going to care about your product? Are you actually competing? So there's a legal risk and a commercial risk. So it's it's a it's a complex exercise that we we kind of uh, look at, and it is it is a big thing, and that's why I'm kind of advocating looking at the 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 patent databases and doing reports um, to actually look at it from a commercial uh, perspective. But you you're never going to get to a point where you can guarantee complete freedom to operate and complete elimination of risk there's just too many patents around and it's not worth your time <laughs> to, yeah. to kind of analyze uh, everything so that's my kind of uh, yeah. feeling if, if if i can i'd just like to add one more thing to that because the um i think uh, you know peter you're absolutely right there's total it's just the sheer volume of um of, of patents we have been in a scenario where we were working with a client and we had a number of concepts and they brought in an ip lawyer to assess those concepts so that you know it was it was another you know and that is i guess in that larger scale project where you have the freedom to do that where you can bring somebody in and assess project uh, concepts before we really do anything further with them um so that that was a really useful um setup and also you know ip is not foresees uh, area of expertise so you absolutely have to factor that in in terms of you know budgeting for ip um advice throughout the project so yeah brilliant thank you guys uh, i am conscious of time so I, I, i'm going to draw the q a to close or at least i'm just about to draw the q a uh, to a close because i am aware that there was a question that was actually more specifically um aimed at technology scotland and myself from paul um who asked if product design scotland have any plans for future events supporting more socially driven uh, innovation uh, startups uh, I guess the short answer to that is uh, no, not specifically, but provided such an event sort of ticks our remit as a technology based organisation, then we would certainly be interested uh, in doing so. So I've put my email into the chat, Paul, so perhaps we could follow up on that and we could discuss a little bit perhaps maybe what you had in mind and where Product Design Scotland might be able to um, support. OK, so that is now the uh, very nearly the end of today's session just leaves me to thank our panelists first of all um for for all sorts of things for the presentations for helping to pull together the toolkit for the great discussion at the end um as well many thanks for that thank you to those uh at home or your office wherever you are um for uh, your engagement um for your questions um, do take time just to quickly look through the Q&A because as well as the questions, there's some good bits of information to be put in there from some of our attendees as well. So if we take time just to uh, look at that. As I mentioned before, the, the, the session has been recorded, so you'll be able to look back on that at your leisure. Um, and of course, please do go and check out um, our toolkits as well. The next lot of toolkits will be released in the coming weeks and the next session is on the 23rd of September. So if you're not already signed up and you felt like today was valuable and I hope you did, I'm sure you did, uh, then please do sign up for that one uh, and we'll hope to see more of you back there um, again. But until then, enjoy the rest of your Thursday and uh, yeah, hopefully see you soon. Thank you. So much, Cheers. <laughs> well done. Cheers. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye bye.